So there are many videos on YouTube or Facebook and so books in the bookshops that you can buy that say how to make a living from music. And that's what this one's called. Now, there are other videos that explain sort of processes and, you know, how to do it. Lots of those videos, however, are made by musicians who are very, very successful. You know, they're, they're really comfortable. They've got all sorts of things going. They might have spent years uh, in the in the business or they might have got lucky with something and luck does still play a part with music you can be lucky to get something and you could be a musician who's 10 times better than that other musician and, and not see anything but the thing is you can't go through life worrying about those sort of things or sort of chasing chasing and chasing and chasing and chasing and in a way, I've been very, very lucky because I've chosen diversity as my sort of musical sort of uh, raison d'etre. I'm able to make a living by doing lots of different things. Now, this um, sort of film is uh, divided into chapters. Feel free to scroll to any bit that you'd like. Um, there are a few chapters describing various aspects of what I do. So really, my first thing. So chapter one social media. Now, the reason I've put this at the top is because it's it's created it's polarizing people. Uh, there are uh, musicians, really. Um, musicians are very envious types. They can be really, really competitive, almost to sort of point of destruction, really. Um, you might see a friend of yours who's a musician who's managed to get a tour with a band going so, you know, doing a road trip across the US or going to an island to do a gig or something. Um, the answer is that won't be their lifestyle. Um, I've done some touring. Um, I've been lucky enough to go on, to, on tour in Japan many times. Um, and yes, it's you can tell people about it and people go, oh, I wish I could go on tour, be a musician. But actually, you know, they have their sort of grim side. The most the, the the most sort of grim part of it is being exhausted. You just, you're tired all the time. You get to the venue and it's a very much a sort of groundhog day in existence in, in lots of ways. So social media can be to blame for a lot of people's bitterness with music um, or somebody's making more money than somebody else for a given genre or whatever it happens to be. And the answer is you've just got to put that to one side. You've just got to get rid of it and just go, okay, Social media should be used by musicians in a positive light. There are lots of really good groups on Facebook, you know, debt musicians in the UK needed or Dorset musicians. I'm a member of that or guitar players on Facebook or the bass guitar or um, home recording or whatever it happens to be. Be a member of all those groups because you never know who might be watching when you put up a video of you playing. On the other hand, Put something up there with no expectation at all, um, because every time you do things like that, you're just, you know, you're putting a name out there. Go to some gigs, go to some jam nights. There was somebody who suggested to, uh, said to me that I should be going to, you know, five jam nights a week in order to be, you know, seen. And uh, I don't believe that's really a very good way of doing things because it can turn you very bitter, you know, especially if you, I live about 100 miles from London. So if you're going up to London all the time for jam nights and coming back and, and not getting anywhere, um, it can be a very demoralizing process. And actually, I've never done that. I've never gone to a jam night, I've never gone to things in order to be seen because I've, I know so many people who do that and don't get anywhere. I just think, well, it's best avoided then. <laughs> You know, if you want to go to a jam night because it's fun, that's a different ball game. You know, if you if maybe if some friends are going, yeah, have a jam and a drink, that's different. But if you go there with the the, the sort of with the, you know, the, the purpose of being seen, you know, it, it could be a disappointment. So there's social media. So the next chapter, diversity. What do I mean by that? Do you, does that mean you would lose your musical identity, for example, if you if you are, um, I don't know, a soul bass player or a jazz guitarist or a rock guitar player, or maybe you are, you know, you're an Irish fiddler or whatever. 
diverse being diverse doesn't mean losing your identity um, at all. Uh, and you should always be mindful of this. But I worked it out the other day. I do 10 different things as part of my income. 10. I've got 10 jobs. <laughs> so I've got I teach in four different schools. I'm just going to refer to my list here. I've got my little iPad crib sheet here. I do four different schools. I do gigs. I do electronic maintenance. I'm an examiner. I do school workshops. I make library music and I do YouTube. Now, somebody says, well, YouTube that can't be a job. Doesn't make money, does it? Well, it, actually it does. And I've started receiving money from Google for YouTube videos. And it's great. It's so deeply satisfying that people out there are interested enough in what I do. I start making money out of it. Yes, absolutely brilliant. So there are my 10 things. Now, if I lost one of those things, it's not not a big deal, really. Um, so as a musician, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. It's never going to work unless you you're prepared. If you're in a band or sort of trying to get a record deal or whatever it is, you know, if you're happy sleeping on other people's floors or, you know, having no real social life at all, perhaps, you know, perhaps that's fine. Perhaps that's a price worth paying. You know, don't know. So what I'm going to do discuss in the, the coming chapters is the things that I do that I believe make me that allow me to to live the lifestyle that I live. So. The next chapter, then, let's start with gigs. And the reason I'm going to start with gigs is because that's what I started doing exclusively as a self-employed musician. My first gig was playing on a round the world cruise liner and it was for the Saga line. So it was all older people. And I sort of went in thinking, <laughs> you know, and yes, to a certain extent, we were playing, you know, wartime songs and Mersey dotes and stuff like that. But I met a lot of people on that boat, a lot of musicians that essentially started me on the gigging life when I returned from that cruise. Up until then, I'd been working as a technical engineer in EMI studios in Goldhawk Road. So I saw the sort of tail end of the big studios in London before lots of them started shutting down. So, you know, I'm very lucky to have seen that side of things as well. So playing on the cruise liner made me a good chunk of money with which to kind of get going because I was away for seven weeks um, and then paid seven weeks severance pay when we all got sacked in Australia. That's a different story altogether. <laughs> so being a gigging musician revolves around a few, I would say, rules. The first one is if you're offered a gig for a certain amount of money and you say yes, that is the end of the discussion on the money side or the things like petrol or staying over somewhere. You build all that into your gigs. If I am offered a gig 300 miles away for 80 quid, of course, I'm going to say no. You know, you would unless you were absolutely desperate to do it. Um, and that is also a problem. If you do lots of gigs like that, where you drive miles and miles and miles and miles and miles for very little money, it's only going to lead to more of those. Lots of people say, oh, yeah, it's great for exposure. You know, we'll get some gigs. You're not going to. It's not going to happen. If you do pubs, you'll and you're bitter about doing pubs and you think that you'll be able to get out of the pubs by playing to somebody who is, you know, got a club in Lanzarote. It's not it's not going to happen. It just won't happen. So you have to be, be diverse. You have to be prepared to do things that maybe you weren't so sure about doing in the first place. You know, I'm a, I play bass, you know, I play, um, you know, uh, I do rock bands. I do some jazz gigs, you know, and if somebody said we need um, um, a gig, we're doing a Pantera tribute gig. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll listen to I'll go and, you know, do a couple of Pantera albums and learn how to play b bass on those. It's not my sort of music. You know, I'm not really into that, but I'm quite happy to do it if somebody asks me to do it and if there's money involved, because one thing that also happens is if you do, if you play a genre that you're not so interested in, but you get through the gig, you're kind of driving home wired thinking, oh, 
that was great okay and then you want to do more of that and that's how you start to diversify and you think well if i can do that that means i could probably do that as well don't you know don't spread yourself too thin and don't just say oh i'll do anything i'll do anything i'll do anything because you still need to retain your identity maybe you're a soul singer but you may want to sing some jazz or you may um do like a rock and pop gig or something you know don't lose sight of who you are as a musician but if you're able to diversify and do lots of different things then it's then it's really worthwhile sometimes i play violin um I'll, I'll play a wedding outside in some you know some nice country house somewhere and the bride's walking down the aisle and i'm stood just near the groom just playing a piece of music while she walks down it's it's deeply satisfying what a job to have especially a nice sunny day and you're playing an instrument and then you you give somebody a bit of a memory that there is something memorable about doing that um and sometimes it can be two of those in a day you can have that you can be going to do um you know some you know dinner dance somewhere it could be you could be playing at the con club you could be doing a, a this you could be doing somebody's really nice wedding in a you know holland park in london or whatever i played a really nice gig in um you know a restaurant in holland park and it was very nice very nice indeed and i got some gigs out of it so if you do if you stretch yourself if you're I mean, musician and musicians and business, they're not exactly bedfellows. That's the trouble with lots of musicians. They don't know how to ask for money, which is one reason why, you know, pubs, pub money has kind of ret remained the same for decades, really, um, because they expect that they will have musicians who will work for that sort of money. But if you get better gigs where you ask for a bit more money and they say, oh, yes, that would be fine. The more often than not, you will get more gigs out of that. So etiquette at gigs. Lots of people kind of think they can just be themselves. They can just do the music and that's it. It's it doesn't really work like that. You have to be you have to have a good manner with the client. I know this, this might be teaching people how to suck eggs, but I've seen bands that just, you know, treat the client really bad. They just think, oh, really? So things like turning up early and wearing a nice suit, you know, setting up and being prepared for anything, being utterly flexible. If you're booked from nine till midnight, but the bride comes up and says, look, we're really sorry. We're not going to be ready till 10. Do you mind staying till one? That'd be fine. What's an hour? Yeah, it's you know it's a bit different if it's four in the morning you say well we you know we weren't really booked for this but if it's if you shift times you just say we'll do anything you like you know we could do one set we if you are completely and utterly down the down the line with a client they will recommend you to all and sundry so the practicalities of gigs things like um if you quoting for a gig and it's a certain distance you build fuel costs and travel costs into your price you don't say oh well f fuel will be an extra something such and such they're more likely to say oh okay well we'll look for somebody local so build the fuel cost in build you know go and stay in a travel lodge for 29.95 or something include that in the package pa don't hire it out to them say it's all included but you you know if you want to a bit of money for your amp and speakers then you build it in so you just have all of that you give them a single price and that's it and then it just magically happens and you take all the worry away from them you take all that sort of financial sort of toing and froing you take the you take the need from them to look elsewhere for other bands they say oh sounds great and then they book you so um you know we're going to going to gigs going to play take spare things with you spare guitars i know this is sounds this sounds really pathetic but people forget these things and and it's a shame really and it's almost playing somebody's wedding for example it's almost more important to have the the look and the and the sort of rapport and the the manner it's almost better to have that than than maybe have having uh, a slightly better musician on your gig who doesn't do those things so it's very important so next chapter then now i've talked about gigs um now i'm going to talk about session work um now 
I have a, an uncle who moved to London in the late 1970s and became a session guitarist, very successful one. And he still does sessions, although he's moved out of London now. So it was now he's talked to me about session playing and I listen to everything he tells every single word he says to me. I listen to and take on board. Uh, a friend of mine is a drummer about the same age who kind of went through that same uh, same sort of existence, you know, doing uh, session work, some gigs and some tours and that sort of thing. Now, if you look below in the description box, you will see a link to my uncle's video talking about how to be a session musician. And of course, it's very tongue in cheek. It's essentially how not to be a session musician. So I'm going to sort of paraphrase him a little here and, and explain a bit what about what I do if a session comes in. It could be that I've been booked to do some strings. It's a string session. Now I'm going to talk about this from a classical musician's perspective and a rock and pop musician's perspective, because I do both things. And I think this might be useful to both fraternities, if you will. So if I'm booked to play violin, very often it will be to play some parts. Somebody will have parts worked out on, you know, Logic or Cubase or whatever, and it's got the string sounds. They say, well, we just need the proper string sounds. and Usually, if the session is well enough in advance, I'll say, well, can you print off a score? And uh, if they can't, you say, just send it to me, send the, the file on its own and I'll work it out and then turn up to the session. Now, you are already offering your services before any money has been discussed. Now, some people might say that you're selling yourself short, you're doing work for free. Well, to a certain extent, you have to do you have to do something, you have to do some prep work. After all, if you're a musician, you would have done decades of prep work to that point. You would have learnt your instrument. You would have, you know, your parents would have spent thousands of pounds on music lessons, or you might even paid yourself. And, uh, you know, those 10,000 hours or whatever it is of practice, you know, so you've already, you've already put in the groundwork. So putting in, you know, another 10 minutes of writing in a, writing a line out in advance of the session really isn't a biggie. So, there's, of course, there's session musicians, uh, you know, involve, you know, reading things like this, where you've got the dots on the page. Now, as a classical musician, you would probably want to see that. But my advice to any of the any sort of um, orchestral fraternity, any classical people watching is learn how to improvise, learn how to play blues on your instrument. It could be oboe, bassoon, blues, bassoon. Why not? We live in an, a, an era now where the number of genres, number of music genres, is just thousands and thousands. Yeah, if you go into iTunes and go name a genre and it will give you this list of stuff. Whereas, you know, in 1970, you know, you have rock, you know, the beginnings of heavy metal, blues, soul, uh, funk, um easy listening you know running out of running out of words whereas now you know it's dubstep or you know hardcore you know hard house house drum and bass you know there's so many genres that have sprung up through the advent of electronics but if you're a classical musician you should be able to improvise it's my only bugbear with the sort of mainstream sort of classical teaching is that it's not done enough it's not you know, five minutes of every lesson, if the teacher plays a chord on the piano and says, right, play me a tune, improvise over that. I don't understand why it's not done. I really don't get it. Um, it's so, so important. And that means that if you're a classical musician and you turn up, you get your violin out or your bassoon or whatever, and you can be playing a tune, you can be improvising. And the other side of the glass, when the engineer is doing the set level check, the producer will be going, oh, OK. Could you play a solo for us too? Um, could you play this? Or you might get asked back to do a session on something else. You might suddenly get the gig to do, you know, somebody's record because you can improvise. So having that sort of multi sort of faceted approach would be really good. If you are a string player and you can arrange strings. So if you are brought in as a session player with, oh, we need a bit of violin on this. You can sit there with some manuscript paper writing stuff out while the, maybe the vocalist is doing their take or the guitarist is doing their take. You've got the chord sequence and you can arrange some parts and then go in and play them. And they come out and you go, oh, great. Okay. 
you get more gigs. And I say, I, the only reason I say this is because I've done exactly that and got repeat gigs and more out of it. So you have to diversify. You have to be able to do more than one thing if you're a session musician. Now, conversely, if you are a guitarist playing, it could be anything, could be any genre of music, could be, oh, we need um, some guitars on this record, da 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 you might also be able to, um, you know, you play your chords and you play your lead lines, your solos, and the, the producer will say, oh, can we have about half that amount? Because, you know, just answer the vocal line, that sort of thing. And, you, you know, you do what you're told. Doing what you're told is, um, is something that a lot of musicians will find tricky, um, especially ones who have sort of honed their genre and sort of, you know, they've developed their identity. It can be hard to suddenly... Be put in a, a place where you you have to do what's required you have to do what's asked of you and as a guitarist it might be that you're given a line that you need to play and they say that we want this line and they might play it to you now if you can read a bit or if you're able to tab something out or if they've got the music they might have they might have it on treble clef they might have it on six line tablature they might have any sort of you know, it might be a screenshot of the score on the computer. Learn how to read a bit. Um, lots of people think that it's really, really impossible to read music. And why should I read music? Because I don't need to. Because I play. And actually, the answer is in terms of guitar, uh, lots of the time with guitar, everything is pattern based, which is why guitarists tend not to read treble clef, for example. So it's not like they're lazy. It's just the way the instrument is. But with the genres growing and all sorts of things that are now required you might have to do that so it's worth doing it now of course being a session musician you would turn up early uh, and you would never ever ever interfere with the recording process at all you make friends with the producer and the engineer straight away and introduce us introduce yourself to the artists and and it's all crack a few jokes and then do your job and they will ask you back you know if you if um you know if you sort of have a bit of a tantrum during the session then it's not going to not going to have they just get somebody else so and nowadays there are many 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 more musicians than there really there used to be in this field of course the whole you know rock and pop music thing has has mushroomed so you're going to get more players you're going to get get more really good players without putting yourself down always think that there's somebody who can do the job better than you can and as you get older, it gets harder to accept that there might be somebody of 18 who who can literally knock spots off you and play you into a cocked hat. But you've just got to do your job and you've got to maintain that individuality and maintain that decorum around session playing. So their end of that chapter. Mm. So in this chapter, I'm going to talk about teaching now. Lots of musicians would go, well, you only teach, you know, if you can't, you teach. You know, that's that sort of a, that adage, you know, if you can't play, if you can't play, teach. And it's it's just a horrible generalisation and it's it doesn't it doesn't hold any water at all. And I'm going to explain why. Now, I do a couple of days teaching a week. Um, I teach uh, quite a lot of different instruments. I teach violin, piano, guitar, bass music theory and occasionally a little bit of drums as well and one thing that I've developed as a teacher is to teach the person how to be a musician not how to play um, one piece to the the edges of technical sort of mathematics there's, there's no point in that um, you can train a non-musician to play a guitar solo and they have no idea about music theory at all or or music genres or how to listen to the rest of the band or how to do anything like that so when you're a teacher and you're teaching these things to young people usually um you suddenly you get these sort of series of eureka moments which teach you maybe where you, where you may have gone wrong in the past so you end up being a better musician as a result of being a teacher. That doesn't mean to say that you weren't any good in the beginning, but what it does is it gives you a perspective. It gives you much more of an idea of how you might go about something. When you come home from the teaching and you've got a gig, you sort of think back to what you were teaching that people, and you just, you just 
learn and learn and learn and this the best bit about music is that there's no end that's the best bit and i never want it to end uh, you will keep learning things as you go through life now you know i i don't have a pension um i've got a bit of savings luckily and you know i'm midway through owning my own house but i don't plan on giving up doing this i don't plan on it at all it's um it's it's too much fun <laughs> You know, how lucky I am, my job is also my hobby. Um, but being a teacher does give you immense satisfaction, especially if you're teaching somebody who's really struggling. And I teach at a school where um, it's some, you know, some of the, the young people there, they, you know, some of them can't do their alphabet. And you think, oh, OK. Uh, hmm. And they're learning piano and, you know, you've got a, the, the set of notes A to G and that, that's, you know, that's, that gets tricky. So you just get the dry white board markers out and do red stripes for C and red dots for D and, and get them to use their video cameras. We live in an age now where you've got these little tablets where you can, phones, where you can video. You can get to say to the pupil, get your phone out, video what I'm doing. Then we're going back to the sort of old school music traditions of things being handed down and the oral tradition using one's ears. It's very easy to go through life being um, a, a musician and not use your ears at all. You just sort of go through the motions. And I think being a teacher opens the door a lot of the time into into how young people you know, learn music. I constantly self put myself at the bottom of the learning curve. So, you know, like my flute playing is nowhere. My theremin playing is even more nowhere. My trumpet playing, I can get an octave out of the trumpet, but I like the idea of being at the bottom and trying to learn something rather than sort of, it's very easy if you're a professional musician who is, who has you know, uh, uh, plays professionally on instruments. It's very easy to, especially in the rock and pop world, to to sink into a rut and, th and, and start getting a bit disillusioned and a bit bored. Take up another instrument. It won't half give you an education. And it gives, you know, so we're, you know, it's, that's the teaching side of things, really, that just makes it, makes it deeply satisfying. Um, sometimes I've taught an instrument. I've been, you know, a couple of steps ahead of the pupil because I'm learning the instrument myself makes you practice makes you learn and if you're teaching that it makes you learn more and you become a better musician so actually teaching it's if you can do teach you know, develop that attitude because it's it's very satisfying and people always remember what a teacher can offer you know um, i've got um ex-students who are making very nice livings in the music business and i always think of them and think how lucky I am to have taught them and how satisfying it is. It's deeply satisfying when somebody has learned something and they actually make it their living. It's, it's, it's huge. It's, it's, it's a big thing. So there's a bit about teaching. Now, one-to-one -one teaching, this is the next chapter. One-to-one -one teaching is what I've really alluded to in the previous chapter about teaching but if you're not comfortable or if it's not your thing one thing you can do especially if you're a gigging musician or if you're a recording recording artist or whatever is to offer workshops for uh, schools colleges universities that sort of thing in which you talk about your genre to essentially an audience and you can either involve them or it can be a demonstration and I do a few of these um, and as I said before at the beginning, you know, I'm doing 10 different things. So this, you know, it's just another income stream. But once again, if you demo things, sometimes I do demo a, a, a multi-track recording where I will go in with all the stuff, all my stuff, my drum kit, my bass and my guitars and my keyboards and other violin, other stuff and multi-track something in front of the audience. And then they get an insight into you know, into how to put a song together. But don't worry, you don't need to play all those instruments to do it. You could you could say, I'm going to play some guitar today. I'm going to talk to you about guitar playing and how you would play on a record. So it could be chords, it could be solos, it could be you could take a loop pedal with you. You could basically do anything. And it doesn't matter on what instrument. It could be singing. You could be teaching how to project. You could be teaching stage presence. You could be teaching how to use a mic. There is lots of things that can be done, and many musicians that I know are teachers. 
but there are some uh, some friends of mine who don't teach at all and they you know they 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 struggle a bit for money sometimes you think well do a bit of teaching but they think that being a teacher or doing these workshops somehow diminishes your ability or it takes away the sort of spirit and the dreams that you're trying to chase we all have dreams that we chase and really if if the dream never comes true it's 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 a lot of fun trying to get there um especially if you if you make a living on the way you you, you realize that you're you're you know making a mark even if you don't f reach that final goal so offering a school workshop is really um a, a nice way of of remaining in touch with what you do but without that sort of the being constrained with you know single uh, with one-to-one -one lessons where you're having to teach essentially what you know what they would want to play and teaching a bit of music theory and so you, it's 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 sort of a midway between your gigs and your teaching is doing some workshops now the next chapter earning money while you sleep what a lovely thought and it's possible it's easy to do this do this now I do I have two income streams in this regard one of which is YouTube you're watching this at the moment if you clicked off the advert that says skip in five seconds I would have seen you know 0.73 pence or whatever it is but because I'm building up my YouTube channel I've started earning money from it and if you've got something to demonstrate if you've got something to say if you've got things to play get a YouTube channel together lots of people say oh yeah but YouTube is really hard to get any money it's tight you know you're much better off with this much better the answer is you're better off doing something even if it's not YouTube you can do something else now I record lots of library music now I got this idea from the my same uncle I was telling you about who moved to London in the 70s he did lots of library music and um, he still does it now and I still do it too now what happens is every quarter the prs pays out a lump of money and says oh, your song has been used on x and x and y tv program in sweden or wherever the answer is if you are um, able to come up with genre specific things non-lyrics definite beginning definite ending and maybe some edits you do a one minute version or a three minute version your work can be used and you essentially you record it for free and you part with it for free there's no money changes hands at all now what happens is the library company take your material and it becomes theirs so if you're getting precious about a song don't give it to a library company however if you just think oh oh that yeah i quite like that but it's it's all right stick it on a well or not on a cd anymore send it email it to the library company and the better library companies will offer some sort of production advice they'll say well look this probably won't be used because it's not loud enough or there's not enough bass or could you remix it so the library companies are only doing this because they stand to benefit as well so it's a win-win situation you end up being a better recordist um, a better musician and understanding more about library music now it can be that uh you offer more specialized genres um my uncle has seen a lot of money in one go off one acoustic guitar tune that he's done why not if you've got two hours spare you know if you do a morning's teaching you come home and you're twiddling your thumbs for a couple of hours go and record something and then make an album send it off now there are lots and lots of library companies there are lots of small library companies but it doesn't really matter if those to you to the musician if those small library companies are sort of bought out by bigger ones because the catalog just goes with it as well so it never stops i'm receiving money from tunes i submitted 10 years ago and it's still paying so you know you might you know if you've had i don't know 20 30 pounds a quarter for the last 10 years that's 1200 quid for maybe a, a song that took you an hour to produce 1200 quid an hour isn't a bad rate and it'll keep going so in the next 10 years it might make the same and it might be the same again and same again so if you've got lots and lots of stuff out there it becomes a pension or it becomes a holiday fund or it becomes all sorts of things the you know the the fuel on my van <laughs> yeah it pays for that or it pays for anything 
And it's nice. It's quite um, it's quite satisfying to do that, to think, oh, I'll pay for that. And then when it comes to paying for that, you think oh, that's easy, easy enough to do. Now, of course, making an income stream like this is also important because it smooths the gaps. If you have maybe a fallow period where you haven't got many gigs, so this could be January, for example. Yeah, nobody's got any money after Christmas and you're kind of sort of bobbing along the bottom during January and February, just waiting for the gigs to come in. But if you've got this YouTube thing and the library thing, I know the PRS only pay out, they pay out in um, April, July and October and then December. So yeah, the first few months there aren't, there isn't any PRS payment, but if you've got income streams that you can rely on, you can start smoothing out your monthly income. And as a self-employed person, you don't have the, the, the magic paycheck every month. Some months you might not earn anything at all. In fact, that happened to me in August this year. I was going, um, I've made I made 50 pounds in the first three weeks of August. Well, you know, it's rough with a smooth. And yeah, September it actually was really busy. But you've got to be able to have that sort of, you know, smoothing off of your income. So there is a bit about earning money sort of while you sleep, as it were. So there, here endeth that chapter. So in the next chap chapter, um, how did I get into being an examiner, a music examiner? It's really nice work. They're a great bunch to work for, maybe RSM. Really nice people who recognise fully that we are all jobbing musicians. How, how cool is that? So what I started doing was doing some jazz exams. So I go for an interview, play some piano. Now, to be an examiner, um, for the ABRSM at least, you need to be able to play the piano. But you can become an examiner for one of the other exam boards, even if you don't play the piano, maybe one of the rock and pop exam boards. And as is the case with lots of exam boards, they don't expect much of your time. They just ask you for a clear week every school term. So you just offer your weeks examining and sometimes you'll get the work in, sometimes not. So, you know, it's very much like, will there be a gig next week? Not sure. Might be, might not be. So it's a very similar sort of strand of work. But one thing that does happen with the examining work is it, it really gives you a, a, a good perspective on how you come across to other people. And if you're a gigging musician, sometimes you don't even need to worry about that. You just pick your instrument up and you just play. You don't need to communicate with the crowd unless you're the singer, in which case you need to. And, you know, if you're in a band, you always need communication between one person of the band and the audience. It's, it just doesn't work otherwise. So it teaches you how to um, how you you know, how you come across to other people and how you deal with other people. And as a musician, it's really, really important to learn that skill because more often than not, you can get jobs and gigs depending on the person you are and how you conduct yourself. And being an examiner for me has given me a lot of insight in how to behave towards a, a large range of people. You know, how you treat um, a six year old child that comes in doing their little prep test or grade one or something, or how you t um, treat an adult candidate of 75 coming in doing a, you know, grade three in something. It's a really good skill to acquire. And actually being an examiner doesn't take up a huge amount of your time, but it gives you much in return and you get to go and see various places and they give you your hotel expenses and they pay for your fuel and and all sorts of that so as a musician if you can get into one of the sort of exam boards or be an examiner it it does more than just give you another income stream it gives you very valuable practice as a musician so there are my 10 things actually uh, there's one more there's one more chapter whatever it is fixing your own gear mending stuff now any instrumentalist whether they play an acoustic instrument or an electronic one should have an idea of how the thing works you know modern electronics it's often very good but what happens if you plug your guitar and you don't get any sound how are you going to how are you going to deal with that um the obvious answer is to take two of everything to a gig, take two guitars, two amps. But there will come a point 
if you're a rock and pop musician where you need to get something repaired now very often i, I speak from um a sort of um almost an electronic layman's point of view even though i have a degree in electronics very very often if you're an uh, electronic musician the problem with your piece of gear is more than likely than not to be control knob switches anything that's an interface between you and the amplifier or the guitar it'll be where you plug a jack plug in it's hardly ever going to be circuit failure um unless you you know you turn up an amp so loud that it blows a speaker or you you know you, but you know if you're going to kill something uh, more often than not so if it's something that suddenly doesn't work it's not going to be a biggie to fix nine out of ten times so your guitar doesn't work or the volume control or something's suddenly broken it'll be a wire that's come off inside the little jack plug on your guitar or it might be that the switch has failed or something like that in which case you can get a new one and solder it in so being an electronic musician being able to solder things is really useful you can see a video of that on my channel how to solder up um, an xlr lead or solder a cable together or basic maintenance of a guitar if you're an acoustic musician let's say you're a flautist you should have in your possession a set of replacement pads some glue and a set of small screwdrivers it's not rocket science and it means that it can be the difference between you not being able to work and being able to work you know lots of lots of us myself included insure their kit you know this is my all this stuff is how i make money so you have to be you know you have to pay for insurance but then again you might be able to insure it earn that insurance policy back by having a youtube channel for example so things like mic stands where you know you need a um a, a replacement sort of nut in the, the mic stand so if it goes wrong at a gig you can just get the spare out of your car and put that on so having spares having the the knowledge that a musical instrument is a is a man-made object and therefore not infallible to failure really is it's key to being able to maintain your sort of existence as a musician so having basic uh, skills now safety first of course if you're an electronic musician and you've got an amplifier that you open up be aware that there will be large voltages in there even if you just switch the thing off so if you're working on valve amps i would be very careful and if it's something to do with a valve circuit it's best left to somebody else but if you've got a valve amp and you love valves and have a transistor amp in reserve that you know you can just switch on and it'll just you know it'll just switch on it, you know you haven't got valves to worry about or bouncing the thing up and down or whatever to worry about so there we are there is hopefully a selection of bits and pieces of advice that may or may not be useful to you